Well, we are very, very fortunate to have a Holocaust survivor, Hannah Lewis, here in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a privilege to have you here, Hannah, if you don't mind me saying, because this is a part of our history that a lot of people my age and younger are becoming less and less familiar with, and I think we do need to become more aware about what happened to stop it happening again. So can you tell us what your situation was, how you got caught up in the labour camps? Well, I was born in a very small town called Wadava on the, on the borders of the River Bog. And I think that probably the camps came quite late to us. My family were very established there and uh, very happy and quite well known, and quite well to do. I think we were probably rounded up. At first it became a ghetto because more and more refugees from big cities wanted to find comparative safety. So at that point our house began to fill up with other, with other Jews looking for somewhere, somewhere to live. And a ghetto was formed and I actually have photos of my grandfather and my uncle in the ghetto. Um, we were rounded up, I think it must have been 1943, and we walked to a camp, a, a forced labour camp called Adampol, which was probably, if you can call it lucky, luckier than being sent to Sobibor. I was actually born very close to Sobibor, and if you were sent to Sobibor, you had a very short very short term, two days at the most, to survive. Hannah, how old were you? At that point, I was born in 37, so I must have been 43, uh, 6, 7. Mm. Six, do you remember that walk? I do, I remember that walk very well. I remember that the weather was nice, and I remember that when I got tired, either my mother or my aunt or my father, somebody carried me part of the way. We actually were rounded up as a family. And we ended up in a forced labour camp in a small village called Adampo. And I've been back there twice since because I just wanted to make sure that what I remembered, I actually remembered. Mm. And it's not very much changed. At the time that we were there, there was no electricity and there was no running water. Because I remember my mother, when she was working, having to carry big buckets of water umpteen times a day because you know you use a lot of water you don't realize how much we use and so what happened in the camp itself and what happened to your well, family in the camp itself um, my grandfather was killed in the first Einsatz group um, my father eventually managed to escape with his cousin and join the partisans which was good my mother was allocated to work for a very old, well, he seemed old to me. I always remember him as Staripan, which means old man. He was somebody that my grandfather and my father knew because my parents had um, a sh big shop in Vodava and they owned properties and they owned the flour mill, the sawmill. So they knew a lot of Polish people because in the villages, Small townships because they were either milling their flour or doing something for them so they knew them and when my grandfather heard because there was no escape that there was going to be a work camp there or nobody really knew what a forced labor camp was he and my father went to see this old man who was purported to be the sort of go-between between the Germans and the and and, and the population and asked him he gave him whatever he could and asked him not for himself he didn't know where we would be sent but if we were sent there would he do his best to protect his two grandchildren I had one little cousin who was born deaf and mute and the old man did his best I don't think he had any power but I think probably in fifth by 43, I think the war wasn't going quite as smoothly as they would have liked. And he, um, he was an old bachelor. He had a, 
his niece and her family helping him run the farm, which was sort of his biggest farm. And my mother and I were allotted to work for him. We still slept in the camp in what I can only describe as sheds with drawers. <laughs> you sort of laid in. But all of that actually was OK as long as I was with my mother. And it was brutal. So it was just you and your mum at that time together? Well, only, at, yes. In the, all the men, for some reason, had either escaped or been, or been killed. And what happened in terms of... I mean, did, did your mother survive the camp? No. Um, my mother survived till almost the end. Um, she was very, always very calm and very capable. But towards the end of the war, we didn't know it was the end of the war, I got typhus, I think. I mean, typhus was rife because there was absolutely no hygiene or doctors. And my mother asked if we might spend one night in the kitchen because there was a big oven which gave heat. And we were, we were, allowed, we, we were, we were allowed by the, the, the old man's um, niece to do this. So my mother made up the bed and it was very, very cold and we settled down for the night. And I was restless and she was restless and sometime during the night there was a little tap tap on the back door window and my mother sat up, listened and it happened again. So she went to the window and it was so frosty that she couldn't, she couldn't wipe it, so she opened the little window and there on the doorstep was my father who as I said had escaped and joined the partisans and one of the things that partisans did would be to warn camps if they could or get a message that there was going to be an Einsatzgruppen and that's what he was doing. Can you just explain what that is? An Einsatz, Einsatzgruppen were elite squads who would go to places and do executions. So they would line people up. They'd line you up by whatever they wanted you to. And the horror of that is is we know it happened, and yet the horror is still very, very hard to to perceive. Yeah. How important is it that we hear not only your story, but also look back in the, at, the, at the films and the textbooks and the, the museums that there are and what have you, to actually understand that this, what happened, that this was human beings acting against human beings for no good reason, well, to make sure that this does not, cannot happen again. I think what happened was an extraordinary crime because the Jews weren't at war with Hitler. I think that the cold-blooded extermination of a, of, a, of a whole section of community was awful. I think it has to be education. I think, I mean, I'm very involved with the Holocaust Educational Trust, and I go into schools and universities and banks and all sorts of places, and sometimes I'm quite taken aback at how little knowledge they have. Mm. So if it is, it is taught in schools now, but I think it's very difficult in three sessions or four sessions to get what led up to it, what happened, and the awful atrocities. Was, was your mother then taken away by that? No, well, what happened is they were having this, there was this roundup, and my father said to my mother that she should come with him. And my mother said, no, Hanetchka's not well, and he said, bring her with, and she said, she won't make it. And whether it was the searchlight or whether it was a patrol or whatever, my father obviously disappeared. And my mother and I just stayed there. And very early in the morning, there were the usual sounds. There, was, there were sounds that are somehow relevant with, with what they did. And we just stayed there. And then I don't know how long this was, but there was a whack on the door. And my mother, who was very calm always, 
got on her knees, gave me a huge hug and a kiss, and then very calmly, without hurrying, went to the door, opened it, and closed it behind her. And I just waited for her to come back. I thought she was bound to come back. But the noise continued, and she didn't come back. So I opened the door, and I stood on the steps, and I saw them marshalling them all to this well that she always drew water from. And we always made contact, eye contact, but we didn't this particular time. And I was just deciding whether I should go and take a hand when somebody barked out an order. They were all lined up by the well and they started to shoot. And I saw her fall and I saw the blood on the snow and I knew in that one moment why she wasn't looking and I knew I could not could, I could not scream or do anything. So then I went back and put myself on this pellet and somehow survived the war. And after the war, we weren't ever actually liberated. We were just left alone. And nobody knew what was happening. And nobody came for me. How old were you at this point? At this point, it was 45, so must have been eight. And you were left completely alone in that labor camp? Yes. And, yes, but there were people, and people were kind. I mean, mm. you know, people not, mm. haven't lost all their sensitivity. Um, and then one day, my father appeared. <laughs> he had walked from I don't know where. He was dirty and skinny, but it was my father. And so another part of our life started. We left Adampol. We went back to Fordava, where I was born. My father and my grandfather had obviously foreseen what was happening because he dug up suitcases which held family albums and, and, and artifacts. And we eventually made our way to Woods. And in 1949, I came to England on my own without my father to live with his aunt and uncle. Can I ask you just to, to finish? How you've how how have you managed to, to move on? I mean, obviously you're doing a, you tr a tremendous amount of educational work on a subject which is in, in, incredibly um, hurtful and, and and sad for you. Are you able to do that without bitterness? Looking forward. To, have you, I is is there a benefit to? Uh, almost a sense of forgiveness. I know it's a very difficult word in a way, but it's. Do you, do you understand what I mean? I in know terms what you're of, saying. Are, yeah. are, you, are you asking me, do I forgive? Yes, in a way. Okay, well, I don't know that I have forgiveness. Mm. I don't think I'm empowered to forgive for the people who were tortured and killed. I don't no. speak for them. No. And for myself, I don't know that I have forgiveness, but I have acceptance. Mm. I can't change it. Hannah, it, it, it is uh, quite something to talk to you, and it, it is very, very important to hear your story, I think, and I hope that it will resonate with people, actually, as we remember all that happened in the Holocaust. Thank you very much indeed for talking Thank to you. us today. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah.